All right, everybody. I think we can. Uh, I think we can start organizing for the public lecture if everybody's ready. Have a seat. There's still plenty of food. We get reprimanded if we send food back, so please take care of it. Since Chris, Chris challenged me to sing and dance, I'll sing and dance. <laughs> so oh, we have some more guests. All right. Good evening. Welcome to our spring symposium where we sing and dance. Um, our spring symposium is uh, dedicated to uh, the work of uh, Glenn Lowry, to honor the work of uh, Glenn Lowry. This is sponsored by the philosophy department and by the Applied Ethics Center. My name is Nir, I'm the um, director of the Applied Ethics Center and uh, a philosophy teacher here at UMass uh, Boston. Very, very honored and very, very happy to um, have uh, Professor Lowry here with us tonight. Professor Lowry and I go back uh, a long time uh, to uh, around uh, 2002 or 2001 when I first uh, met him uh, a little bit later, uh, read his Anatomy of Racial Inequality book. At the time, uh, I was uh, writing a dissertation on uh, political reconciliation, trying to understand what it was, and reading Professor's La Professor Lowry's uh, book helped me um, figure out that the missing piece that I had been looking for uh, had to do with uh, empathy, and uh, in part I tried to apply the kind of argument that Lowry uh, makes about racial relations to uh, international relations, so I've certainly been uh, deeply influenced by Professor Lowry. Professor Lowry is uh, one of our uh, greatest economists and uh, public intellectuals. Uh, he's the Merton uh, Stoltz Professor of Social Sciences and Economics and Professor of International uh, Affairs and Public Affairs at Brown has taught at many other universities uh, before that, Harvard, BU, Northwestern, University of Michigan. He has a BA in uh, mathematics from Northwestern and a PhD in economics from uh, MIT. Um, I'll uh, read you some uh, highlights from uh, his bio. As an academic economist, Professor Lowry has published mainly in the areas of applied microeconomic theory, game theory, industrial organization, Natural Resource Economics and the Economics of Race and Inequality. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Economic Society, I'm sorry, of the Econometric Society, and a member of the American Philosophical Society. He served as Vice President of the American Economics Association and as President of the Eastern Economics Association. He won the 2005 John von Neumann Award, given annually by the Ryak Laszlo College of the Budapest University of Economic Sciences to an outstanding economist whose research has exerted a major influence on students of the college over an extended period of time. And in 2016, he received the great honor of being elected Distinguished Fellow of the American Economics Association. Professor Lowry has given the prestigious Lee Lectures on Politics and Government at Oxford in 2016, the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Stanford in 2007, the James A. Moffat uh, 29 uh, lectures in ethics at Princeton in 2003, 
and the Du Bois Lectures in African American Studies at Harvard in 2000. As a prominent social critic and public intellectual, writing mainly on the themes of racial inequality and social policy, Professor Lowry has published more than 200 essays and reviews in journals of public affairs in the United States and abroad. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, is a contributing editor at the Boston Review, and served for many years as a contributing editor at the New Republic. Professor, La Professor Lowry's books include One by One, From the Inside Out, Essays and Reviews, on Race and Responsibility in America, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, and Race, Incarceration, and American Values. Professor Lowry is the father of five and the proud grandfather of six. He's a native of the south side of Chicago and currently resides in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. So, Professor Lowry, thank you very much for making the time and for joining us and for this wonderful day so far, and very much look forward to your lecture. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, you guys. Thanks a lot. Good to be here. Nir, thanks for the invitation. I'm honored. A day-long symposium on my work doesn't happen every day. Um, good to be back here in Boston, uh, where I lived for many years when I was teaching at Boston University and at Harvard, um, and uh, happy, I suppose, to be addressing myself to this subject, though um, I'm a little bit of mixed feelings about it, as you'll see. Uh, for those who've read my Lee lecture, um, Politics and Policy, that I gave at Ox, uh, Oxford um, almost two years ago, I apologize because I'm going to reprise some of that lecture here, uh, for those who haven't, you've got a treat in store. <laughs> Let me cut right to the chase. Um, here's my revised title for the lecture. Persistent racial inequality in the US, what's a self-respecting black intellectual to do? Three things are going on in that subtitle. Self-respect, racial identity, and a reflection on the intellectual's vocation. So I'm asking myself, in the face of persistent disparities by race in American social life, what are my responsibilities? What am I supposed to do? What's more, I am by now well into my seventh decade of life. I've been around for a while, watching my country grapple with fundamental issues around race and inequality, justice, civil rights, inclusion, oppression, discrimination, stigma, bias. At times, it feels to me that we're not getting off square one on these problems. Now, I know that, as a matter of fact, structures have changed and laws have been enacted, reforms have taken place. I know that norms have evolved, that relationships have developed crossing the racial divide, that organizations have been formed and good work is being done. A struggle for racial justice, whatever one might mean by that, goes on. I get it. And yet, and yet, I sometimes feel as though we haven't really gotten off square one. So I invite you to consider my dilemma as an African-American intellectual facing a prospect that the subordinate status of blacks in the larger social structures could become a permanent reality of American life. There will be many arguments over why this is so. I've written about this. But for now, I wish merely to focus on the fact that here in the 21st century in America, the relatively disadvantaged status in our society for a class of people descended from African slaves shows no prospect of being reversed in the foreseeable future. This development, I maintain, has profound political and ethical consequences. It poses a great challenge to our democratic principles. And my frustration derives from the fact that it seems to me sometimes we keep circling back to the same set of arguments and the same set of dilemmas. It gets a little discouraging. Given all of that, I wish to ask, what's a fellow to do? How ought I to take a stand? Those are my questions. One answer, which this economist has arrived at, reluctantly, me being an economist, is that for the sake of social scientific acuity and moral clarity on the issue of race, it's imperative to give priority to what I'm going to call relations over what I'm going to refer to as transactions. This was mentioned in the panel earlier, and I want to bore in somewhat on that uh, set of distinctions. Bear with me for a moment as I try to explain exactly what I mean 
by this somewhat cryptic construction. In my scholarly work over the last 40 years, I've expended considerable effort trying to explain to myself and to the world why the subordinate status of African Americans persists in the United States. Some of this thinking was summed up in my monograph, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, which was published by Harvard University Press. The book sketched a theory of race applicable to the social and historical circumstances of the United States, speculating on why racial inequalities persist. It advanced a conceptual framework for thinking about racial, social justice in matters of race. It was one part social science, one part social criticism, and one part social philosophy, themes that were uh, pursued in successive chapters entitled Racial Stereotypes, Racial Stigma, and Racial Justice, deriving from a synonymous series of lectures I had given at the Du Bois Institute. I wish to fix ideas for this afternoon's presentation by briefly reviewing some of those arguments because I believe, along with the distinguished UCLA soci sociologist Rogers Brubaker, whose book Ethnicity Without Groups has much impressed me, that one ought not to invoke racial aggregates as the subjects of social analysis unreflectively. So please bear with me. I assure you that the relevance of this introductory conceptual excursion will be clear soon enough. A theoretical discussion of this kind properly starts with an account of the phenomenon of race itself. Why do people take note of and assign significance to the skin color, hair texture, and bone structure of other human beings? How have the superficial markings on human bodies taken on social significance to the extent that people routinely partition the field of human subjects whom they encounter into groups? with this sorting convention based on these subjects possessing some observable bodily marks. This is a universal feature of human societies. But why should this be so? I proposed, acknowledging in advance that there was no great originality in this, to conceive of race as a social construct, a conventional, not a natural category. For me, then, the term race refers to indelible indelible and heritable marks on human bodies of no intrinsic significance in themselves, which nevertheless have through time become invested with social expectations that are more or less reasonable and social meanings that are more or less durable. A particular interest to me is the possibility that powerful and derogatory social meanings can even be internalized by persons identifying with a stigmatized racial group, even people like me who might hope to study such matters more or less scientifically. How does one achieve the objective observer's stance while enmeshed in the tangled web of identities, fealties, and conflicting narratives, which is the nature of racial discourse in America? Note, we are dealing here with two processes, categorization and signification. Categorization involves sorting people into cognitively manageable subsets on the basis of bodily marks while differentiating one's dealings with such persons accordingly. Signification is an interpretive act that associates certain connotations or social meanings with those categories. Both informational and symbolic issues are at play, or as I like to put it when speaking of race, what we're really talking about is embodied social signification. A self-conscious awareness that the marks one bears on one's body convey profound significations to those one encounters in society can be an impediment to one's psychological health, particularly in a country like mine where, because of the need to justify chattel slavery in a nation which self-consciously understood itself as the land of the free, the mark of blackness has been infused with long-enduring derogatory significations. This social cognitive conception of race may be contrasted with acts of biological taxonomy in which one sorts human beings based on some presumed variation of genetic endowments across geographically isolated subpopulations. Such isolation was the human condition until relatively recently on an evolutionary time scale, and it may be thought to have led to the emergence of distinct races. Now, as we all know, the use of the term race in this way is controversial, particularly when one aims to explain social inequalities between groups. Thus, when scientists like the noted population geneticist Luigi Cavalli Savorza, or social critics like the noted philosopher Anthony Appia, deny that the term race refers to anything real, what they have in mind is this biological taxonomic notion, and what they deny 
is that meaningful distinctions among human subgroups pertinent to accounting for racial inequality can be derived in this way. I am not arguing with this point, though it is eminently arguable as far as I can tell. What I wish to emphasize here is that using race as a category of social cognition is conceptually distinct from the more dubious use of the concept for the purposes of biological taxonomy. To establish the scientific invalidity of race demonstrates neither the irrationality nor the immorality of invoking racial classification as acts of social cognition. It is in this social constructivist spirit that I shall be using the concept here with an emphasis on negative interpretive symbolic connotations attaching to blackness. Fundamental to my approach in that book was the distinction between racial discrimination and racial stigma. Discrimination is about how blacks are treated, while stigma is about how blacks are perceived. I argued that what I called reward bias is now a less significant barrier to the full, partic full participation of African Americans in US society than is what I called development bias. Reward bias pointed to the differential treatment of persons based on race and formal transactions, thereby limiting the rewards that blacks might receive for the skills, talents, and so forth that we present to the market. By contrast, development bias referred to impediments that block access of persons in a subordinate racial group to the resources that are essential to develop skills and refine talent. So reward bias rests on a foundation of racially discriminatory transactions. But development bias, in my mind, is rooted in racially stigmatized relations. Since many resources that foster human development only become available to persons as the byproduct of informal, race-influenced social relations. Obviously, these two kinds of bias are not mutually exclusive. Skill acquisition can be blocked by discriminatory transactions and a regime of market discrimination that is under pressure due to economic competition may require for its maintenance employing the instruments of informal social control. Still, I think this distinction useful for whereas the moral problem presented by reward bias is straightforward and calls for an uncontroversial remedy via laws against discrimination, development bias seems to present a subtler, more insidious moral problem and may be difficult to remedy in any manner that is likely to garner majoritarian support. This difficulty has both a cognitive and an ethical dimension, I think. From a cognitive point of view, many observers may find it difficult to distinguish between blocked developmental opportunities, on the one hand, and limited capacities or distorted values, on the other, when seeking to understand a group's poor social performance. And in terms of ethics, many citizens who find the transactional discrimination associated with reward bias to be noxious may be less offended by the often covert and subconscious relational discrimination that underlies development bias. That is, they may object when a white police officer treats a black youth unfairly, but say nothing at all when white families move away from a racially integrated residential community because, their fear, because of their fear of the threat of what they perceive of as black crime. So perhaps you can now see what I'm after when I declare relations before transactions. I'm pointing toward the idea that the subordinate position of blacks in the economy derives from our stigmatized status in the society and not the other way around. Stigma inhibits blacks' access to those networks of social affiliation where developmental resources are most readily appropriated. Today's problem is not so much a race-influenced marketplace or administrative state refusing to reward black talent or to accord blacks in equal citizenships, as had been the case in decades past, I maintain. Rather, today's problem is mainly a race-tinged psychology of perception and evaluation that at some level withholds from blacks the presumption of an equal human worth. A racial group stigmatized status in the social imagination and in its own self-understanding may be reinforced, justified, and socially reproduced as a result of that group's subordinate position in the economic order, thus creating a vicious circle, as David Lyons pointed out earlier. Here we have a world where the notions of racial dignity, racial inequality, racial subordination, racial inferiority, racial honor, racial pride, racial shame resonate powerfully such has been my world 
for those very notions about honor and dignity, about equality, pride, and shame have been central to my own biography. I will return briefly to this personal theme at the very close of this lecture. For now, however, I need to say a bit more about what I mean by the term racial stigma. To do so requires me to talk a bit about human capital and social capital. In my 1976 dissertation, yes, I know, I don't look like that could possibly be true. <laughs> I used the phrase social capital. That was a stroke of good luck for me because a few years later in his important treatise, The Foundations of Social Theory, the great, now late, great sociologist James Coleman credited me with having been among the first to do so. I want to contrast social with human capital by way of saying more about what I mean by the term racial stigma. Please bear with me. To make what could be a long story somewhat shorter, in human capital theory, a paramount question is how do we account for differences in the earnings capacity of persons in society? What is our theory as economists as to why the distribution of income and earnings looks as it does? Why are the wages paid to workers in this occupation higher or lower than what is paid to those pursuing that occupation? What, in a market setting, is the relationship between a worker's remuneration on the one hand and activities undertaken by that worker which enhance productivity, like effort on the job, formal or informal ed uh, education and training, delayed childbearing, migration, since the choice of location affects proximity to complementary productive factors, health, because investing in preventive care and nutrition can enhance the productivity of the human organism, and so on. That's human capital theory. This approach to explaining how people come to get whatever reward they get in the labor market is what I mean by human capital theory. The theory in economics builds on an analogy with well-developed theories of investment. Assuming competitive markets, rational choice by forward-looking individuals, and analyzing human investment decisions in light of an agent's time preference, anticipated rates of return, and available alternatives for the use of time. So human capital theory takes this intellectual framework, well developed in economics for understanding investment, and imports it into the realm of studying human inequality. Now, simply put, what I've been doing in some of my theoretical work over the years is exploring the implications of the fact that an association between business and human investment is merely an analogy, not an identity. That is, I've been questioning this tendency to equate the mechanism of investment as it pertains to machines, to firms making plant and equipment acquisition decisions, for example, with investment as it refers to the development of human beings. Important things are missing in the human capital framework I maintain. There are really two points, with, points which I want to emphasize about this incompleteness. First, my first observation is that all human development is socially situated and mediated. That is, the development of human beings takes place inside social institutions. It takes place as between persons, in the context of human interaction, the family, the school, the peer group, the youngsters who hang with each other in the neighborhood and play basketball together or whatever. Such institutions of human association are the places where growth and development occur. Many resources essential to human development, the attention that a parent gives to her child, for example, are not alienable. They are not commodities. For the most part, human developmental resources are not commodities. Development is not up for sale. There are no markets on which you can trade it. What I mean is that the structure of connections between people and society creates a context within which developmental resources come to be allocated to human beings. The allocation of those resources may not be fully responsive to prices. As a result, it may not always be a good metaphor or a good analogy to reason as though this were so. The family is one such institution. This point is absolutely fundamental since the human developmental process begins before birth. And the decisions about whether or not, for example, a mother attends to her health and nutrition during pregnancy in order to encourage the neurological development of the fetus are decisions that will be affected by whether the mother comes from a family with resources, whether a husband is present, whether she's 16 or 26 years old, and whether supportive social services are provided, and a myriad other thousand things that I could name, all of which come together to shape the experience of this newly born and maybe not even yet born infant who will develop one day to be a human being about whom it will be said that they have this or that much productivity. 
as reflected in the wages that they make in the labor market or the test scores that they manifest on some paper and pencil examination. It will be said of such persons that they manifest this or that much productivity. Well, what I'm saying is that they're not machines. The productivities that they manifest, the capacities that they express are not merely the result of some mechanical infusion of economic resources. They are the byproduct of social processes. My second observation is that, as mentioned, what we are calling race is mainly a social and, not, and only indirectly a biological phenomenon. I hope to persuade you that this point, along with my first observation regarding the inadequacy of an analogy between human development and investment in plant and equipment, is critically important when discussing racial inequality in the United States. Persistent racial distinction between large groups across many generations in an open society where diverse people live in close proximity one to another is irrefutable evidence of deep-seated division, segregation, and separation between racially defined networks within the social structure. Much could be said in this vein, but just to cut right to the core of it, there would be no races in the steady state of the system unless on a daily basis and in regard to their most intimate affairs, people paid assiduous attention to the social boundaries that separate themselves from racially distinct others. Put differently, over time, race would cease to exist in a society unless persons in that society chose to act in such a way as to biologically reproduce the, ver the variety of phenotypic expression that constitutes the substance of racial distinction. Now, that was a long sentence, and it's important to me that I'm understood here, so let me repeat. Race is not something simply given in nature. It is a socially produced thing. It's an equilibrium outcome. We're making it. In every society where protracted differences exist, differences that take a physical expression and that persist over centuries, like in our society, it's something that we're doing. It's not coming from on high. It's endogenous. There are a hundred ways that I could say it, but I think you get the point. And my second point is that if the goal is to understand durable racial inequality, then it's really important to attend in some detail to the processes which cause race to exist as a persistent fact of life in the society under study, since those processes will almost surely not be unrelated to the allocation of human developmental resources in that society. Put differently, what I'm saying is this. The creation and reproduction of race as a feature of society rests upon a set of beliefs and conceptions about identity held by people in that society, beliefs about who they are, about the legitimacy of conducting intimate relations, and here I don't only mean sex, although I do mean that too, with racially distinct others. And my key point is that beliefs of this kind are likely to also have consequences for whether or not persons enjoy equal access to the informal resources that individuals need to realize their full human potential. Because this point is so critical to my argument here, I'm going to say it in yet another way. My argument to this point is that classical human capital theory can be incomplete in two ways. It's incomplete in that an analogy between investment in people and investment in machines may not attend to the socially situated context within which the resources that promote human development become available to persons. And in the context of studying racial inequality, the analogy is incomplete to the extent that it does not attend to the interaction between, on the one hand, social processes which ensure the reproduction of racial difference in that society, and on the other hand, the processes that facilitate human development. For example, let my child be musically talented. I've seen her at the keyboard and noticed that she could be a great pianist one day if only she had a teacher. But I have no money for a teacher. Suppose I go to the banker with the following narrative. My daughter here is very talented. She could be a great pianist one day. I tell you what, invest in 15 years of lessons and I'll give you 10% of her royalties for the first 25 years of her performance career. Now, such a contract is not likely to be written because it's not enforceable. As a result, that talented kid may never get the lessons. The capital market here is incomplete. So even if we were to accept the idea that physical and human uh, investments are a good analogy, a firm might be able to borrow against future earnings in a way that an individual might have a harder time to do. Now that's, of course, a simplistic illustration of the much more general point that I'm trying to make about relations and resources necessary to develop human potential. What if we change the hypothetical so that the child may get the, have the talent and may get the lessons but won't practice? won't practice because others with whom the child interacts in the neighborhood disdain the practice of the piano, thinking it uncool. 
And the good opinion of these peers becomes important to the child. There's some evidence supporting the view that in the United States today, at least to some extent, a part of the difference in the intellectual preparedness of youngsters across racial lines turns on the fact that for some, peer group pressures discourage doing what is necessary to fully develop intellectual talent, seeing it as a portrayal of racial identities to have done so, thereby fostering a so-called oppositional identity. I'm not marrying myself to that theory, but I'm saying that it has a certain plausibility. Historically oppressed groups time and again have evolved notions of identity that cut against the grain of their society's mainstream. As a result, youngsters can be discouraged from the outmigration, which after all, is in some sense a full, fuller expression of their humanity. We're all leaving some community if we grow as human beings. We're always moving out to broader horizons. We're always redefining ourselves. That can be threatening to an insular group that has been suppressed over many years, and a culture of repression can develop around that threat, and that culture can inhibit a talented youngster with resources at hand from taking actions needed to develop that talent. In any case, whatever you may think about that as a description of African American society today, stay with me for the hypothetical, because given such a situation, I want to ask, do the kids in those dysfunctional peer groups simply have the wrong utility functions? and are therefore responsible for their disadvantage? She doesn't develop her talent as a pianist because she won't practice because she succumbs to peer pressure. Well, I guess that's a group of people who doesn't want to practice and the peers are inhibiting that from happening. And is that the end of our ethical discussion? Are we done? Can that possibly be the end of our analysis? Now, here's my point. It's not an adequate account to say dysfunctional behavior in, oppress, in an oppressed group shows those people to have the wrong utility functions when their utility functions have emerged from a set of social formations that have been historically generated as a result of the larger society structures and activities. Again, my point here is that human development takes place in a social context. We must attend to the relevant social context. These are not markets, ethnic communities, local cultures seeing themselves in opposition to the majority, families that are not integrated across the boundaries of race in a society, those are not markets. Rather, they are complex, morally ambiguous, and difficult to regulate phenomena embodying and reflecting what people see as the meanings that give significance to their lives. So I've always been dissatisfied with economic approaches to understanding racial discrimination in America, where the social significance of racial categories plays no operational role in the theory. This struck me and continues to strike me to this day as massively ahistorical. Of course, as a theoretical exercise, one can elaborate a price theory for markets where traders are averse to doing business with some group marked with an X and where it won't matter what the X signifies of the sort that the great uh, late economist Gary Becker did in his classic book from the 1950s, The Economics of Discrimination. I'm not against that program as a theoretical exercise. I'm just saying that to do so would leave the analysis incomplete. When I first read that book, sitting in my library, Carroll at Northwestern University in 1970, I was thinking from the south side of Chicago, this is America, man. A neighborhood across the town had just, across town had just burned to the ground. There had once been an institution called slavery and so forth. This was, after all, America. I thought blackness was certainly not merely a cipher, not simply an X, not merely a mark. It meant and still means something. And those distorted meanings must have some part in the perpetuation of racial disparities. I intuited this 40, almost 50 years ago. And actually, what blackness means in America often has negative connotations. It can mean uncivil and backward. It can mean licentious. Its aura is morally compromised. A dark exoticism and otherness hovers around the actual meanings of blackness in America. Such negative connotations have developed over the years in America, I thought, sitting in my library, Carol, reading Gary Becker's book, The Economics of Discrimination. How else could one explain why some racially defined people in our society were not marrying the other, I thought. They're not marrying them, don't want to live next to them, are not so happy sending their children to the schools they attend, and so on. And even when they are prepared to accept the better of them, they nevertheless remain ever vigilant to the possibility that the ones they took to be better might not be so after all. What I'm talking about here in a word is racial stigma. And even in 1970, I had the vague sense that the theory was incomplete and that this incompleteness was stark and graphic when one considers the question of race. I thought this because I saw the context for human development and human investment as racially tinged and unequal, since structures of social connectedness, connectedness were and are, still are, 
so racially disparate. But I also thought this because I could see that race, that is blackness, was not and is not an arbitrary marker. Rather, this symbol is laden with historically generated meanings particular to our society, meanings that in the case at hand have a stigmatizing, negative, degrading, subordinating connotation. This point was fundamental to me. Because without this insight, one may do something that, though not illogical, is nevertheless a mistake. One may say, as many more or less conservative commentators have in fact said, but look at the immigrants to the US from the east and south of Europe. They too were despised, and yet in 50 years they integrated into the society. The words Slav and slave have a common root, and so on. Or one may say, Look at recent immigrants from Asia and even from Latin America. They too have been despised in various ways, and yet they have advanced in our society, even as the blacks of inner city Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Oakland, etc., continue to lag. What's wrong with those people? Without appreciating that some marks on the body signify things, negative things, dark things, otherness things, that influence the chance for people bearing those marks to develop their human capacities, Without seeing this, you may attribute the backwardness of these people who have been stigmatized to their essence. You may, in effect, say, it must be something about those people and not about us that causes them to be so backward. You will eschew social and political and moral responsibility for their plight. You will conclude that their failure to develop their human potential reflects either the absence of such potential in the first place, and we have books on the shelf making that argument, or you may decide that their failure is due to their backward culture, which sadly, but inevitably, what more can we do, leads them to lag behind. So what I want to say on the culture versus structure question is this. There may be some ten tendency to backwardness in their culture. The jails are full of blacks in the United States, and they are not all political prisoners. It is a fact that two in three children born to a black woman in the US are born to a woman without a husband, et cetera. Those things are true. So yes, I'd say there's some stuff on the supply side. There's something, if you must, if you must, that's in their utility functions. But how did it get there? How did it get there? Is it merely a statement about them to observe that they value something in a certain way, or when we understand that the way people come to value things is created via interactions in society, can it not also be a statement about us? Let me give you an illustration of the second point. My first point, of course, was that investments are contextualized, and so social networks within which people are located, the structures of those networks mediating the investments are relevant to a theory of human inequality in a way that they might not be so relevant to a market idealized setting of investment in physical plant and equipment. That was my first point. And the second point was that the marks in question, the symbols that signify racial difference, are freighted with important connotations that then have an adverse effect on a person's opportunities to develop his or her skills. And in the second point, I'm stressing that race symbols have meaning specifically Blackness in the US context has a meaning associated with it that is stigmatizing. And this stigma inclines people to a presumption against the merits of the person bearing the mark. It causes people to start out doubting the assumption that the stigmatized one is like us. This causes the observer to be reticent to entering into intimacy with such a person. A social allocation of developmental resources is not like a market mediated allocation. People are making these judgments not on the basis of straightforward benefit cost calculations, but also on the basis of identity considerations, I am arguing. Who am I and who then ought I to live with and with whom then should I associate and when ought I to extend to this other a benefit of the doubt? Moreover, I'm extending this second point to an observation about the culture versus structure debate because I'm saying there's a mistake that you can make, a cognitive mistake. It's a mistake in the analysis of society. It's a mistake about the extent to which racial inequality is an expression of cultural difference between insular groups of people, rather than that inequality emerging out of a system of social interactions that knits us all together in a seamless web. That's the mistake I want to warn against here. It is a significant error of social cognition to impute causation to traits that are seen to be intrinsic to a subordinate racial group while failing to recognize the system-wide context within which dysfunctional cultural expression is produced and reproduced in society. I need now to give you some examples because that was all very abstract. This is about my second point. Racial symbols have meaning. 
I want to give some examples. Marriage and the family. I mentioned out of wedlock birth rates amongst blacks. I wanted to illustrate how we can take the cultural thing as if it were simply there, when in fact, it's something that we're producing, all of us. So here's one example about marriage and the family and child rearing. You look at gender relations between black people in the United States, which is to say divorce rates, out of wedlock childbearing, marriage rates, and so forth. And you comment, ah, look, look, look at how they are. But I want you to look at intermarriage rates between blacks and whites in the United States. They remain quite low, though they have risen significantly in recent decades. Now, I cast no aspersions. It might be that black women are getting propositions from white men and are turning them down. I don't know. But I do know that in the equilibrium, there's a low rate of cross-boundary mating between these two groups, and I strongly suspect that this fact must have implications for human development, for the resources available to children, and for the generation and transmission of wealth. Moreover, it has implications as well for the dating and mating market among African Americans because we're a small minority of a population. We're roughly one in eight Americans, so if white men and black women were marrying at a higher rate, black men and black women would be interacting in a different way. How? I don't know exactly. That's not my point. That would be a study. Mine is a higher level observation. My point is that to observe in the social equilibrium that there are different rates of out of wedlock birth across black and white subpopulations and then to impute that difference to something about black culture would be to fail to see how the marriage market is situated in the larger context where a higher rate of cross-boundary mating would substantially alter intra-boundary behavior. So what one might take to be culture just might turn out to be structure after all. What you took to be a characteristic of those people, why don't they marry, how can they bear their children in such disorder, just might turn out to be a question about us. Why do we avoid intimacy with them, et cetera? They are segmented, despised, looked askance upon, and are generally of no interest for intimate relations. Indeed, they are of little interest at all, except as a topic of cocktail party discussion about their depravity. All right, excuse me of a little anger kicks in here, but the current political rhetoric in the U.S. on these questions can be unnerving. That was one example. Here's another example. Consider the war on drugs in the United States. The fact that the number of people locked up in prison and jails in the U.S. went from 1980 at 500,000 to over 2 million by the turn of the 21st century. It quadrupled in 20 years. Blacks are one in eight or so Americans, but we are nearly one in two prisoners in the United States. There are more black people in prison in the U.S. than there are people being imprisoned in some pretty good-sized countries like Germany or France or England. The war on drugs very clearly was a policy choice that had something to do with this. It was an expression of public sentiment. Political campaigns were run on the issue. Growth and imprisonment in America has been partly due to explicit efforts to contain narcotics trafficking. Now, you don't have to be a French social theorist full of abstractions to see the drama that has been enacted in U.S. society around punishment where a massive mobilization of resources has been undertaken attended by the corralling and physical control over the bodies of a largely non-white and poor population. And the political rhetoric around this, protect our children, keep ourselves safe from, well, safe from the scum, from the rabble, are terms that come to mind, keep us safe from the element that threatens our civilization. You don't have to be Jurgen Habermas to see that something really profound is being enacted in such a society. This is not just about policy. Policies signify. And the racially disparate incidence of a massively punitive policy like the war on drugs signifies massively. In doing so, it both engenders and draws upon a wealth of social meanings that are harmful to the developmental prospects of black people. But what I really want to say about the war on drugs is this. Everybody is getting high, <laughs> excepting people in this room. The data on drug consumption, on admissions to hospitals for emergencies from overdoses, on the opioid epidemic, on treatment facilities and so forth, who goes and seeks medical care for addiction and so forth, on the much touted opioid epidemic, as I've said, reveal all, reveal that all classes, all races, all regions are in the game. Drugs are a massive consumer market involving everybody, everybody. Small wonder that such a black commerce would disproportionately enlist into its employ those at the margins of society. That can be no surprise. So too with the violence 
that attends the traffic in drugs. If one cannot write an enforceable contract, if one cannot call upon the apparatus of the state to protect one's property, then one is in a state of nature and disputes are gonna get resolved through violence. There's nothing new in that. That's been the truth of the world since forever. So it is that there's violent trafficking in drugs in inner city communities in the United States, which are heavily black. And so it is that persons who participate in that commerce find themselves incarcerated. I'm not making excuses for them, but the fact is that institutional structures involving people of all races and classes, complex structures, together with a massive discretionary mobilization of punitive resources have worked to promote racial disparities in the incidence of incarceration. The result has been the corralling of a great many black bodies, and this result reflects the symbolic degradation of blacks, even as it reinforces an interpretive pose that absolves the larger society of any responsibility to consider reforms. A superstructure of ideas and ideology reinforces and legitimates the status quo and removes any lingering ethical doubts about who is to blame for this mess. The observation I'm making right here is that how a society answers the question, who are we, is a very significant issue. And you can bet it's a live question in the United States today. Who are we? Whose country is it? When talking about crime, about violence, about school failure, about urban decay, about prisons and so forth, is it a matter of the, in the back of the mind that can be understood as us versus them? Because if it's us versus them, anything is possible. It becomes possible to say about those people, that's not my country, that's some third world thing. This is actually said during the flood of New Orleans in 2005 uh, to, uh, after Hurricane Katrina, but it's a lie. Black people in New Orleans have been there, many of their families, for over 200 years. They're not aliens. They're as American as you can get, as American as anybody could be. That was us down there during that catastrophe, crawling onto rooftops. That was us huddled in the Superdome. That was us. It was a quintessentially American affair, not simply a measure of the inadequacy of black culture. It reflected our social inadequacy, I want to argue. And I buttress that argument by observing that the incompleteness of human capital theory, by observing the incompleteness of human capital theory, and by insisting that human developmental resources are socially contextualized, and by stressing that race plays an elemental part in all of this. Thinking in this way, I believe, helps account for the durable racial inequality which America, with which America is still encumbered. Consider the poor central city dwellers who make up perhaps a quarter of the African American population. In the face of the despair and violence, the self-destructive folly of so many people, it is morally superficial in the extreme to argue, as many conservatives now do, that if those people would just get their acts together, like many of the poor immigrants, we wouldn't have such a horrific problem in our cities. To the contrary, any morally astute response to the social pathology of American history's losers would conclude that while we cannot change our ignoble past, we need not and must not be indifferent to the contemporary suffering issuing directly from that past for which we bear some collective responsibility. I can put this more pointedly. The self-limiting patterns of behavior among some poor black people in the central cities of this country are not a product of some alien cultural imposition on an otherwise pristine Euro-American canvas. Rather, the pathological behavior of those most marginal of Americans is deeply rooted in American history. It evolved in tandem with American political and economic institutions and with cultural practices that supported and legitimated those institutions, practices that were often deeply biased. So while we should not ignore the behavioral problems of this so-called underclass, we should discuss and react to them as if we were talking about our own children and neighbors and friends, this is an American tragedy. It is a national, not merely a communal disgrace. And we should respond to it as we might to an epidemic of teen suicides by embracing, not demonizing, the perpetrators who often enough are also among the victims. Okay, so let me conclude on a somewhat personal note, as I promised that I would. I believe it's very important to bear in mind something that I know from firsthand experience, which is that disadvantaged African-American families are not passive in their alienation. Rather, 
They construct meaningful worlds for themselves amidst the storm. Consider, for instance, those who are connected via bonds of social and psychic affiliation to the vast numbers of incarcerated men and women in this country. Those people truck up to prisons to visit a kid or a parent or a partner going through a rite of passage that is all too familiar. They bail someone out of the clink knowing that the money could be lost. To save their own hides, they may have to turn loved ones over to the cops. They live with relatives who steal from them. They are one in the same persons and at the same time victims as well as perpetrators. They know, they know that this phony political dichotomy between us and them is morally fraught, given that any one of us falls, depending on the day or even the hour of the day, to one side or the other of that divide. A biographic life may be lived on both sides of the line, but having staggered back and forth across the line of propriety many times over its course, nevertheless, one's imagined life can be seen in retrospect as unified in its righteousness and justified in its condemnations. In this regard, I know whereof I speak. As it happens, I've passed through the courtroom and the jailhouse on my way to this distinguished podium. I've sat in the visitor's room at a state prison. I've known personally and intimately men and women who lived their entire lives with one foot to either side of the law. In my mind's eye, I can envision voiceless and despairing people, perpetrators and victims alike, who would, I might, who would hope that I might represent them on an occasion such as this. I know that these revelations may discredit me in some quarters, but I've long since stopped caring about that. It seems clear to me that there are individual, communal, and social responsibilities involved here. Persons must be held accountable for their wrongful acts by the state. That behavior is conditioned by myriad influences beyond one's control cannot be allowed to cancel one's accountability. Moreover, families and communities are, to some considerable degree, responsible for the behavior of their children. The task of socializing a child is inescapably a familial and communal one that can be aided by government action, but only in the crudest way. Still, in the end, there's no escaping the need for social action mediated by government and politics in which resources are mobilized in the public sphere to help meet the needs of the indigent. We can argue about how this is to be done and about the extent to which such social provision should be provided, but a decent society cannot tolerate with indifference the kind of deprivation that is to be observed on a daily basis in the lower reaches of the American social order. The question before us now, when pondering the implications of persistent, persistent racial inequality on the scale I have been alluding to here, is whether the United States of America can, even at this late date, rise to this challenge and show itself to be the decent society, the city on a hill, which its boosters, those celebrants of American exceptional, exceptionalism, imagine it to be. My journey to these issues has taken unlikely twists and turns. It has involved not only the courthouse and the jailhouse, but my many years as a conservative pundit. It has included a religious rebirth, followed by a repudiation of that religion, and then as if to prove that God has a sense of humor, a re-embrace of it again. And it has brought me finally further to the left of the political spectrum than I would ever have imagined possible, although I am quite sure that's not far enough for many of my critics. I am Glenn Lowry, the elder of two children raised after an early divorce by a single mom. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s and the 1960s. Although the neighborhood was rough, my family was comfortable enough. My father was a high-level administrator with the Internal Revenue Service at the end of his career, and my mother was a secretary with the Veterans Administration. I had cousins who went on to become doctors and lawyers, but I also had relatives who died of drug overdoses or who spent years in prison. In his book, Code of the Streets, the ethnographer Elijah Anderson describes two broad categories of social orientation in the inner city, what he calls decent families, who tend to be working poor rather than unemployed and who value self-reliance, hard work, education, and church, and what he calls street families who turn to lawlessness to make ends meet and violence to settle conflicts. My family had a little of both, sometimes in a single person. I'm thinking, for instance, about my Uncle Mooney. He was a legitimate small-time businessman, a barber and a dry cleaner, but he sold marijuana out of the back of his barbershop routinely. I'm thinking of my great aunts, Cammie and Rosetta. 
who fenced stolen goods as a regular course of events. They had young women who were shoplifting clothing and foodstuffs from retailers, and they'd give those women 20 cents on a dollar. And they had big freezers in their basements so that whenever you wanted to do a family thing, you knew that you didn't go to the stop and shop to buy your ham or your turkey. You went to Aunt Cammie or Aunt Rosetta. They were church ladies. They wore those big hats and drive cars with the big fins on them. They were the salt of the earth, these people. They were born in Brookhaven, Mississippi. They migrated to the Chicago area just after World War I, and they made their way against an implacable racism. They overcame, but that's what they did. The memoir that I'm uh, telling people I'm working on, but actually haven't made as much progress as I ought to have done, uh, paints a vivid picture of my upbringing in Chicago in the 50s and 60s with characters like my mother, Gloria, whose nickname was Gogo. -Go. I had attended five different elementary schools before completing the fifth grade. Her sister, my Auntie Lois, who rescued my sister and I from our itinerant life by bringing all of us into her own household. Their brothers, my uncles Alfred and Adlert. Eloise's husband, my uncle, called me when they started integrating the money, Mooney. He was not a big fan of integration. They weren't integrating the money, he wasn't interested. And my great aunts and uncles, who initially migrated north from Mississippi after World War I. I can recall the hustling, the rent parties, the strangers to whom rooms in our home were sometimes let, jazz music and the blues everywhere. Likewise, premature death, rampant adultery, hipsters and gangsters with style, enormous social vitality. The Chicago of my youth exuded beauty and brilliance amidst compromised standards and awful pain. My uncle Adler drank himself to death. While our close family friend, Boo Boo, was a brilliant student, he had to watch his father fatally shoot himself in the head while sitting on my mother's living room couch. A kid that we called Pig, a grade school nemesis of mine, ended up with a life sentence for killing a cop. The quiet boy down the block, Paul Shumpert, who was a brilliant Little League shortstop, overdosed on heroin at the age of 18. My cousin Ronnie was also strung out. He'd stop by our house from time to time to get something to eat and steal from my mother's purse, which she would knowingly permit. He's hungry, baby, he's hungry, she'd say to me. The kid Stevie, whom I'd known since I was 12 years old, ended up dying in his mother's basement after receiving an accidental gunshot wound to the gut. A gay man with whom I had worked named Chuck was found bludgeoned to death in his apartment, a place where I had spent time with him on a Saturday morning shooting the breeze after we'd finished a grueling third shift at the factory where I worked. My uncle Alfred lived a polygamous life with overlapping families, fathering 22 children altogether. A brilliant uncle Atlert, who graduated at the top of his class from Northwestern University Law School in the early 1950s. Who does that? Who does that as a black man in the middle of the 20th century? ended up being disbarred because he got caught up in some shady family business with the great aunts. And yet, and yet, I vividly recall my Uncle Adler's stunning eloquence, my Uncle Alfred's charm and physical beauty and absolute devotion to his children, all 22 of them, my mother's sweetly melodic voice and giving heart, my Uncle Mooney's grit, enterprise, and fierce independence, my Auntie Lois's steadfast, and sacrificial love of family, her elegance and her ambition, the impressive style of the great aunts, Rosetta and Cammy, their silverware, their lace tablecloths and ivory and mahogany and crystal and Persian rugs and lace curtains, their furniture, their cars, their mink and fox and chinchilla fur stoles, their stylish shoes and hats and precious jewels. I can recall watching my mother dress, dress for Saturday night, go, go, the stockings and girdles, Brasiers, garters, powder, painted nails, hairdos in several colors, the forest of bottled perfumes, colognes, creams, lotions, and oils that covered the top of her dresser. I can recall men's conked hairdos, Sunday socials, fashion shows, teas, bid whist, card games, cookouts, feasts, and parties, every holiday or no holiday at all. It was a world of close-knit kinship, mutual aid, gossip, envy, betrayal, domestic violence, incest, hustling, a world where characters like the fictional pimp Iceberg Slim competed for my attention with the very real cadres of black Muslim devotees who hawk their newspapers, Muhammad Speaks, to passers-by at crowded intersections. Racial identity was of primary importance in the Chicago of my youth. 
That's where I come from. That's where the Merton P. Stoltz professor of the social sciences come from. And I was not alone. I was not an exception. I was not unusual as a representation of the human potential, some of which got developed and some of which different, didn't, that was manifest in that community. White flight had turned many of Chicago's neighborhoods into African-American enclaves, like the one that I grew up in. And the civil rights and the black power movements had fired up young black people like myself. Even as my political approach to the race problem has veered sharply from left to right to center and back to left again, my foundational belief has remained consistent. And this is the answer to my starting question, must, what, I, what must I do? I am a black American intellectual. I must stand with my people. As best I can, I must keep the faith and I must fight the fight. Perhaps then you can understand why it is that I have spoken to you in such a matter this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to take a seat. But I, I'm happy to engage in colloquy at this time, but consistent with the moderator's direction. <laughs> Sure, Christopher. About your identity as a communist. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm interested in that part. It sounds like to me, it's you know, just a pause for not knowing anything about economics, that you've talked yourself largely out of the apparatus and tools and disciplinary uh, techniques that you studiously developed over many years for approaching this problem problem of persistent racial inequality. And I guess I want to just hear a little bit more about whether you think you've talked yourself out of economics into social theory or sociology, whether you, um, yeah, I want to hear about that part of the, the intellectual identity and how you understand that. Especially the, I mean, the stuff on the human capital theory sounded uh, pretty, uh, 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 a set of long-term notes in social theorists about the in, 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 inadequacies of various kinds of economistic thinking about human relations. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm still teaching graduate students. I'm yeah. still publishing papers in journals and stuff like that. I haven't, as it were, talked myself out of the profession. <laughs> I do. Uh, um, one of my former students is a young man named Roland Fryer. He's at Harvard. He's become nationally very well known as an up-and-coming quantitative economist and under my tutelage he got his start and he's, he's doing very well doing big studies about this vet. Uh, the data matter, technique matters, statistics, you know, uh, data don't speak for themselves but you know a little bit of econometrics goes a long way in helping you frame and organize and draw valid inferences from noisy observation. Um, I'm a theorist and I'm, I'm, I'm I've always been oriented toward thinking conceptually, so I'm not, a, I'm not like a green eye shade guy who's content. And even if I weren't talking about race, that would still be true about, about me. But what happened to me was that um, I, I got a fast start and I ended up six years out of my PhD at Harvard as a full professor of economics and African American studies. And I, my previous publishing had been all, you know, technical articles, mathematical modeling, it was in the journals, but there I was. And uh, suddenly I had responsibilities to interact with people across disciplinary boundaries and to talk to undergraduate students who were not, uh, were not uh, quantitative economists, but who were doing social theory or history or politics or whatever. And because of the nature of African American studies at Harvard at that time, I found myself encountering people like Orlando Patterson, whom I've mentioned here, whose book, Slavery and Social Death, published 1982 by Harvard University Press, had a huge impact on me. And it sort of drew me into this larger world. Uh, I started talking to philosophers, uh, for example. I mean, believe it or not, um, I, I started thinking that for these problems to only have a, a sort of technocratic frame, uh, as if, you know, 
uh, we were going to, you know, uh, the, as if the world is a mechanism that is somewhat opaque to our inquiry, but with enough chipping away, we'll finally lay bare the causal structure and, you know, it's the analogies with the physical science and whatnot. And I started to think that that was uh, inadequate to this particular problem. And, and I, I uh, began to become more eclectic in my intellectual experience and, you know, reading history, reading politics and political theory, reading philosophy, reading sociology and ethnography, uh, thick description and things of this kind. Uh, so uh, here I am. I mean, you saw what I had to offer here uh, this evening. Um, I'm proud of a lot of things. I'm just as proud of being a fellow in the American Philosophical Society as I am of being a fellow of the Econometric Society. Um, I, I humbly except uh, that um, where I have tried to write and think and express myself in ways that uh, stray outside of the narrow lines of my discipline, uh, that people have found some value in that. Uh, and I'm, I certainly feel edified by a breadth of intellectual um, orientation and exposure um, and interest. Uh, at, or let me put it more uh, directly. I got books in my office, okay? <laughs> Most of my colleagues don't have any books. Most of my economics, you go to the office and there's a bunch of journals on the shelves and there are no books. I got books. <laughs> uh, yeah, please do. Uh, Barbara, you had your hand up? Uh, uh, I don't know what year Odd Cammy was born. I'm going to guess somewhere around 1900. And um, she was uh, one of like 10 siblings who migrated from Brookhaven, Mississippi to uh, Chicago. And she was uh, not the oldest of the 10, but uh, she ended up, I think, probably being the most prosperous. Uh, she cleaned people's uh, houses. That's what she did when she got to Chicago. And she was very enterprising. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know which of these stories I actually want to tell in public, but she was very enterprising. She was a very enterprising woman. So that by the time my mother was born in 1928, uh, Aunt Cammie uh, was working for a wealthy white family uh, in, um, on the south side of Chicago and was uh, 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 squirreling her money away. And she ended up buying a small little two-flat apartment building somewhere in the black belt of Chicago on the south side at that time. And Aunt Rosetta, similarly. Um, these, they, the stories in the family are told about them making gin in the bathtub during Prohibition and all of that, about them consorting with one or another kind of uh, shady uh, character as they pursued their, um, their interests. But where would they be? I mean, these women, when I came along in 1948, they were already towering figures, these women. They were legendary people, these women. Um, uh, Aunt Rosetta ended up with a six-flat apartment building on the uh, nice part of the neighborhood on the south side where black people were only just beginning to own property and whatnot. She was able to put my uh, uncle Adler through Morehouse College uh, on her own dime. There wasn't any fellowship or anything like that. Um, yeah. They were church ladies. Uh, they had big cars in the garage. They they were um, they they were aristocrats. I mean, this these mink and chinchilla and fox stuff. I'm not making that up. Okay, I'm talking 1958, and they were walking around draped with jewels and what? They were they were and they therefore. Um, I mean, the idea that I was poor. 
never occurred to me, even though my mother was a rolling stone, wherever she laid her head was her home, God rest her soul. Uh, we were not poor. I mean, we were, we were not without some glimpse of what was possible to achieve within this broader, uh, within this broader framework. There was some place I could go and borrow $100 when I became a young father at the age of 18, and not everybody could say that on the south side of Chicago. Where would they be? Um, I like to think that in this latter post-civil rights kind of uh, era, they'd be even more prosperous. That instead of starting out as a washerwoman, she would have gotten a nurse's degree or something like that and would be, uh, would be able to use her talents, her ingenuity, and her, her uh, chutzpah uh, to uh, even greater effect. Um, I, I don't know if I'm being responsive to you or not. You are. Thank you for this. It's very both moving and challenging. Um, I'm wondering if you could say something more about the persistence of race. Um, you gave a very persuasive argument that, that races persist because of what we do and choices that we make, right. and that a major force behind that has to do with stigmatization and um, all of the uh, the things that you've been arguing as, as sort of problematic, but there's also the the way that at, I know some black people feel sort of wanting race to persist, yeah. and um, for me that resonates with the feeling that a lot of Jewish people have of right. wanting Jewishness to persist. And it comes as an issue when parents, for example, are thinking about you know, who it is that their children are going to have children with. Sure. And the, the complexities and the controversies over, given that race persists largely because of racism, that's not necessarily the only reason it, it persists. And how do you feel about whether, whether it should or not? Or whether you want it to or not. This subject came up in the discussion this um, earlier in the day. I actually asked Professor Bloom whether or not he thought that the instinct to close the boundary on a group by encouraging one's children to marry within the group, which is characteristic of uh, Jewish communities concerned about assimilation and also characteristic of some African American families where they don't want to see their children marrying out, was racism. Because I thought he's the local expert on what is and what isn't racism. I'm going to put Larry on the spot. You asked me the question, so let me, let me respond to it. Um, and this is not necessarily a popular position with many African Americans. But I actually think that the idealized, transracial, humanistic, uh, colorblind impulse or value is the only way out over the longer run. You know, am I against affirmative action? Well, I have some problems with affirmative action, to be honest with you, but I'm not saying it for that reason. Do I think race doesn't matter and it's over? We're post-racial? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about the ideal. I'm talking about what we should be striving for. This is not who I am. Now, I'm not saying anything about Judaism. I'm not Jewish, and there's a long tradition there, and it has its own integrity and its own logic, and y'all can work that out. But this is not what I am, okay? This is a, a superficial trait. Is there such a thing as black culture? Okay, yeah, there's such a thing as black culture. Are black Americans a people? I don't think so. Uh, to the people who said back during the days of, of black radical nationalism, of groups like the Republic of New Africa or like the Nation of Islam, black Americans ought to secede and we ought to have our own country. I think it's madness and I think it's ethically infantile. This is Glenn, this is Glenn Lowry. I think it is in a reaction to racism that we end up embracing racism. Embracing a kind of racism. I think if my son comes home with someone whom he loves and she happens not to be black, and I say about that person, son, I want you to marry a black person, I'm committing a kind of child abuse. That, that's, a, that's putting it very, very strongly. I want out. I want out of racial fetishization. I want out of racial, um, of, of, of a, a kind of, when I see my students, I'm talking about black students at a place like Brown, 
I want to say, learn Italian. I, I want to say, find out what's going on in China. I, I want to say, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was 1863. That's 155 years ago. You are not that. We are the son of slaves. All right. You're the son of slaves or the grandson or the great-grandson or the great-great-great-great-great-grandson of slaves. That's who you are? That's how you want to understand yourself? That's your self-definition? You're making a choice, and it's the wrong choice, I want to say to them. And I understand that my, and I don't put this on anybody. I'm not saying that I got it. I'm telling you. You ask me, and I'm telling you. Um, I'm telling you what I think. Um, I think when people say of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and more broadly, of his brokering of certain uh, thematic ideas that America's civic self-understanding, you know, a magnificent promissory note that has gone on, and so forth and so on. I have a dream, you know, my kids will walk hand in hand. When they say about that, oh, that's not the king that we should pay attention to. We should pay attention to the king toward the end of his life because he had that radical edge. You know, that's, they, they, they want to dismiss it as being some kind of superficial, uh, un insincere aspect of America's reckoning with the legacy of slavery. I think they make a mistake. I think the nails in the coffin of Jim Crow were driven not by Malcolm X, but by Martin Luther King. And they were driven not by an angry affirmation of our difference, but rather by an insistence upon the common humanity that we shared with other people. So. That's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Well, I just, <clears throat> I had a couple of things. And you moved me incredibly when you talked about New Orleans. I lived there for a few years. My brother, the, the field hospital at the Katrina. Yeah. I was coming out of, out of Nova Scotia. Didn't hear about it right away until I was, uh, I was we were over the border. My, I, my sister had also lived in New Orleans. So did my brother. Um, he went to Tulane. So, um, but I, uh, all I could think of as soon as I heard it is, oh no, they're going to die. The ninth ward is going to die. Those yeah. people are going to die. That is like, uh, and of course, that's my, my sister was thinking the same thing. She wasn't so with my brother. And I just it remembered. Um, you just made me think of that. The other thing I was thinking about recently, because I just happen to be writing a paper now about, um, oh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a great class gender thing. But I grew up in Dorchester. I grew up in Dorchester, the only Protestants I knew. <laughs> there were Jews at one end, you know, in Blue Hill Avenue. Yeah, the and then 
okay, you told a story, let me tell a story. And I'm, I'm glad that my talk inspired such heartfelt uh, sentiments. Um, so uh, there's a great uh, play by an African-American woman named Lorraine Hansberry called A Raisin in the Sun. Okay, and it's a great play on many levels, but let me talk about one scene. So uh, Walter Lee Younger singer has, Sr. has died, and his widow uh, is left with her uh, adult children and uh, grandchildren in the house that she's living in, and her aspiration with the insurance money is to buy a nice place to live in uh, what is probably now an all-white neighborhood that they will be integrating, but with lawns and stuff like that. They're living in a walk-up tenement. She's not happy there. She keeps a flower pot in the window with this little sprout coming out of it to inspire her thought about the garden that she'll have one day when she finally has a decent place to live. Um, she has a son, Walter Lee Younger Jr., and she has a daughter, Benita, and Benita is going to college. And Benita is reading Nietzsche and Freud and whatnot and uh, is, is becoming a sophisticated atheist. And the mother is a woman from the south of the United States. She's probably in her 50s or 60s, a grandmother, and she's uh, Benita's mother, and she's, and she's uh, a Christian woman. And she prays and she calls on God on, uh, on, on a regular basis. And in Benita's hearing, she does this one day, and Benita uh, says, huh, I have no need for the God hypothesis. And the mother calls her over, and the mother says, uh, what did you say? Oh, oh, all this religious style, I have no need for the God hypothesis. And the mother says, now you listen to me. I want you to repeat after me. In my mother's house, there is still God. Okay? And Benita is recalcitrant. The mother smacks her face. I said, repeat after me, in my mother's house there is still God. So whimpering, Benita, in my mother's house there is still God. And mama grabs her hat and heads out the door. I got business. And she goes out and she slams the door. I can still see Felicia Rashad doing that on the stage in Broadway when she and P. Diddy reenacted this great play uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, it was quite a scene. But in any case, um, I would, uh, I, 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 I've thought about that play and about that scene a lot, okay? Now, there's a kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, existential claim, I'm not even sure what the right philosophical word is here, uh, about the existence of God and whether or not it's rational to believe in what I can't see and all that kind of stuff. And do I really think that there's some invisible being behind the scene pulling strings is there somebody listening when I pray? And there are all these kind of things. I am, after all, an intellectual. I mean, I'm a, I got a PhD from MIT. I'm a thinking person. I don't believe in magic. I don't believe in magic. Okay. So I came to a certain point where I was having a hard time in that uh, evangelical, uh, conserv relatively theologically conservative AME congregation that I was a member of. Uh, the Reverend Ray Hammond and Reverend Gloria White Hammond the church is called Bethel AME, and I'm sure it's still going strong over in, that, in the uh, Jamaica Plain. Um, there came a point where I just couldn't quite suspend doubt. I couldn't, I couldn't quite see the credulity that was needed to be a part of that process. I found my, I, I don't believe in magic, and I, and I was kind of play acting at it. I was pretending. I felt insincere. Uh, someone, she's not here anymore, mentioned James Baldwin. I, I remember this scene in Baldwin somewhere where he's describing how he faked his uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, he faked the speaking in tongues thing because, you know, everybody was expecting something to happen, and he didn't really feel it, but he went through the motions, and I had that experience of faking a kind of expression of transcendent religious experience, which I wasn't actually feeling, and I hated myself for it. So I was kind of in Benita's position at that moment of kind of saying, you know, I've read my Nietzsche, I've read my Freud, I've read my, you know, whatever, and I ain't buying it, okay? I ain't buying it. On the other hand, life will do you a blow or two now and then. Your wife will get breast cancer and she'll die, okay? Your son will come home a gay man and you weren't counting on that. And a whole lot of other stuff besides. And where are the meanings that cause us to get up out of bed in the morning and want to be animated and seek things in life coming from. And there's something deeply satisfying in the millennial traditions of human aspiration, 
for transcendence and for meaning that takes its expression in religious community. So I don't have to believe the, uh, the causality claims about the God pulling the string and the thing happening. God will heal you. But he didn't heal my late wife. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed. You know, let me hope on the chemotherapy because I don't think the uh, magic guy up in the sky with the, you know, pulling the strings is going to pull that string. Okay? On the other hand, reverence, uh, a kind of quiet that comes over and worship, community, tradition, scripture. What's wrong with bending a knee? What, what, what's wrong with the humility, with adopting a stance of a kind of humble agnosticism or wonder, awe? So I came to not be so dismissive at a, you know, at a kind of uh, causal, kind of cognitive level. What do I believe the actual functionality is of, about existence? I'm still doubtful in the extreme. But at a, at a, at a more, um, you know, what is the music of my life level? I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to, to uh, submit myself. Uh, to ritual uh, and to uh, sacrament uh, and to tradition. I don't know that much. I ain't that smart. Last question for the evening, sir. I think it's a complicated story. I, I do think that that's a part of it. I mean, one of the current themes, you know, you have the opioid epidemic. It's getting a lot of press, a lot of attention. A lot of people are dying, and a lot of those people are not blacks in the inner city. They're whites in the inner cities of America or elsewhere. And it said, well, during the crack epidemic, there wasn't nearly as much empathy for drug users and whatnot. And I think that's probably true just as a matter of historical observation. On the other hand, um, there was always something wrong with the war on drugs, and I do think that that started to come across to some people. So, for example, you have this movement amongst conservative Republicans, Right on Crime is one of the organizations, where people are looking around and they're saying, where libertarians are looking around and they're saying, come on, man, this is a massive mobilization, of course, of state resources that's kind of invading people. Maybe this is something people ought to be free to make their own choices about what they're doing and so forth. Uh, you can lock up a dealer after a dealer after a dealer, and another one's going to come down from the housing project to take his place on the street corner. There's no way to uh, kill it off. Uh, look at the uh, havoc that it's wreaking in, the, uh, in uh, the, the, the channels through Central America and Mexico, where they're corrupting everything in its wake as these commodities come in here. And why not? I think the, the war on drugs was going to uh, fall upon harder times no matter what, because it was, is, it was, is. Uh, very poor uh, social policy. So, so yeah. Right, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.